The third issue opens with the JLA having successfully defeated Doctor Doom yet again. Hell, even Black Canary is smooching it up with Hawkeye after he left the Marvel Earth to join their universe. And then the universe hiccups and Hawkeye is gone without anyone remembering he was there. Although Doctor Doom was still defeated by them, now implanted in the Source Wall, that universal barrier where powerful entities end up getting absorbed into it. Ha! Ah, foolish Justice League! I am Doom! Master of the Stick Shift! Becoming trapped in here forever was just part of my flawless plan! And our title page this time sees Eternity making out with Kismet. Oh, for the love of- Could you please stop humping the Andromeda Galaxy? Over in the Marvel Universe, the Avengers, an earlier version of them, just as it had been an earlier version of the JLA, just finished defeating Brainiac, though Captain America feels something is very off about everything. However, they're soon being visited by their old buddies and pals, the Justice League. Superman is also feeling uneasy, and back at the Avengers headquarters, we see some old photos including an homage to when the JSA and JLA first met, only now it's the Avengers meeting the Justice League. As Cap once again starts thinking everything is wrong, the universe once again hiccups. Now they're on the JLA satellite. Even the team members have changed around to different eras for their respective sides. Our annual get-together with the JLA is at their satellite this year, and Ralph and I decided we should have a luau theme. Man, nothing would make me happier than if the rest of this comic was just a massive luau party between the Avengers and JLA. I don't even care about the plot anymore, this is just hilarious. I mean, look at it, even Batman is wearing a lei! I'm Batman. And I'm gonna limbo you under the table, Captain America! Hell, there's even an arm wrestling competition between Wonder Woman and Wonder Man. This is the most ingenious comic ever made, and I am so sad that it doesn't last. Because, of course, every party needs a pooper, and now it's Superman, who really knows something's wrong. Reality warps again, bringing everyone to yet another party, this time at Avengers Mansion, but this time Cap has retained his faculties enough to see how things are changing. Despite the efforts of the people around him to try to remember team-ups between the two, eventually both Superman and Cap just see each other other and start arguing, accusing the other of causing all this until they finally come to blows. However, as soon as they try to punch each other, the universe shatters, reverting everything into a strange, post-apocalyptic wintry setting of a devastated city. Vision and Aquaman are the first to find each other, though things are still not as they should be. At this point, Aquaman had a hook for one hand, but here both are fine, and indeed their memories are clouded. Discovering the Daily Planet building in ruins, they figure they're in Metropolis, but they're still not sure what's going on. How did this happen? Why? Jeez, the Luau must have really gotten out of hand! The two are attacked by a group of supervillains from both worlds who claim that their master wants them dead. Fortunately, the two are saved by Captain America, the Hal Jordan Green Lantern, and a few others. Thor thinks they can track down the person responsible for this, since the villains were touched by the power of this master, and we soon see that things are no better on the Marvel Earth, where instead of a snowy wasteland, it's fire, lava, and earthquakes threatening people. Once more, the respective Avengers and JLA members have put aside their differences to help people and try to track down the source of the quakes. Some of the civilians are clearly from the DC Earth, meaning people are crossing over between each world. Snow starts to fall as a swirl of green and blue fills the sky, and many more civilians start appearing in a ghostly form. The Martian Manhunter tries to read the minds of the ghosts to figure out what's happening, but then vanishes, many of the ghosts appearing in the flesh. Back in Metropolis, we soon see what's going on. Civilians from the DC Earth are being transported over, though the Martian Manhunter soon appears again. The strange storm is linking the two worlds, and he's able to telepathically contact the heroes back on Marvel's Earth to try to coordinate things. When the Flash, who is now Barry Allen, spots a newspaper on Marvel's Earth, things get even weirder. It's an issue of the Daily Planet, where Clark Kent had an interview with Spider-Man. So Spidey, rumor has it you have a lot of clones. How would you compare this to, say, the amount of clones that Superman has? The two sides discover a rift in the middle of everything that's shaped like Krona's face. Their memories start returning, and unfortunately that means Superman and Cap start yelling at each other again. Finally, Wonder Woman and Wasp tell them to get their heads out of their asses and work together to save the civilians in both worlds. The two of course realize that they're right, and figure their only chance of solving this is finding the Grandmaster. The storm starts intensifying, and Superman and Iron Man fly up to try to figure out what's going on. 
Superman's telescopic and X-ray vision are able to see points all around the Earth where the two worlds are merging together. However, as indicated earlier, the two Earths are not the same size, meaning places are merging without respect to their relative locations. And once they arrive in orbit, they spot something even more terrifying. Both Earths slowly being pushed together by giant spectral hands. It's... it's not even possible! I can't be seeing this! I just can't! You're not. Not literally. It's our minds, trying to comprehend, to process what we're witnessing in a way we can grasp. It's a good thing we'll never see literal hands pushing multiple Earths together any other time in our lives, and certainly not during Event Comics Month 2. <laughs> I mean, that would just be kind of goofy. The heroes are able to combine their power and disrupt the rift enough to push the Earths apart. Everyone gets shunted back to their own realities, but it's only a brief respite. The two universes are still merging together, and soon the JLA are teleporting into the Marvel Universe again to join forces. Before the two teams can head to the Savage Land again to try to track the Grandmaster, a new figure arrives to speed the process along. The Phantom Stranger. I can't recall if I've ever talked about the Phantom Stranger before. More or less a very mysterious character in the DCU whose origins have always remained a mystery. Though several different ideas were put forth about him. From being a fallen angel, to being the wandering Jew, to even just a scientist stuck in a time loop. In any event, he's powerful, but mostly just travels around guiding people and providing exposition and whatnot. The New 52 made him into Judas Iscariot. It's an okay idea, but not really relevant here. What is relevant is that he takes the two teams to the Grandmaster, who's not exactly in grand shape. Well, Krona, I gotta say, I'm proud of you. This has been a huge success. Yay us! Pat on the back. Pat on the back. Can't destroy a universe without smashing a defender of it, so, uh, you're welcome. And, uh, it's a tie. The Grandmaster explains what his long game was. He's been trying to merge the universes together and trap Krona between them, hence why there were so many crossovers between the two universes at the start of the story. The artifacts were needed to complete the job, with the idea being that Krona wouldn't destroy universes if his fate was tied to them. Problem is, the universes are just completely incompatible. They're overloading each other and screwing with everything. Not just the crossing over, but it's affecting time, their memories, even their attitudes. That's why Cap and Superman have been so inclined to hate each other. The merging has been screwing with their heads this whole time. Although I love their facial reactions when they hear that news. Yeah, sure. Give me five minutes with this guy and he'll be the one screaming to save Martha. Yeah, sure. Give me five minutes with this guy and he'll be the one who turns into a werewolf. Wow, that actually happened that one time, didn't it? Krona, continuing to be a dick, has decided to instead accelerate the merging process. The incompatibility will destroy both universes, but potentially create a new one in the process. And it shall be called the Amalgam Universe. And thus witnessing a new universe's birth, he will hopefully learn all the secrets of that. You know, continuing our theme of Krona as a crappy scientist, what secrets does he expect to learn from that? Does he think the formula to Coca-Cola is gonna be at the beginning of time? Wonder Woman asks why the hell he can't just separate the universes again if he could combine them to begin with, but, well, look at him. He looks like the only thing he's going to be separated from is his dignity when he can't reach the bathroom in his current state. But yeah, he's been too weakened by the fight. However, he is still strong enough to restore everyone's memories to where they should be, and unfortunately, that shows them everything. Remember, their memories are scrambled right now, and their current state is the one they were in from the 70s and 80s. As a result, characters like Barry Allen are seeing themselves dying during the crisis, Hal Jordan becoming evil, the Scarlet Witch losing her children, and even Captain America in that goofy-ass armor he wore briefly. The Grandmaster seems to die after that, and the heroes are left uncertain what to do. They saw dark stuff in their own future, and some wonder if they can try to undo some of the terrible things they've done instead of just stop Krona. But as Hal Jordan himself points out, there are countless people dead or dying as a result of this whole thing already. Can we choose their deaths because they're easier to bear? The reality we saw, it's the truth. Good, bad, love, pain, it's real. It's the one we're pledged to protect, not not to play God with. Or just throwing this out there, Hal, you could reboot the universe to try to undo stuff while learning nothing, or make deals with Satan to undo plot points you're not fond of instead of addressing them and having genuine character development. Everybody raise your hand for makes it easy. 
Now, of course, Superman and Captain America shake hands and everyone throws their fists in the air, ending book three with their proclamation that they're gonna take on Krona together. Also, Metron is watching this on his giant ass TV because, again, Metron is the smartest of the new gods. Book four opens with Krona relaying his discoveries to Metron, the history of Galactus and how he was the last survivor of an old universe, reborn into the Marvel one by a voice claiming to be the sentience of the universe. Combined with, of course, the image of a hand creating the DCU, and Krona now truly knows that there is some kind of consciousness deep in the fabric of existence itself. His plan now is to force the animating spirits of the universe out so he can learn all their secrets. And then maybe he'll publish a paper on it and get caught up on everything that was recorded on his TiVo. Like Judas Traveler, Krona is one of those characters who think knowledge in and of itself is a goal and can't see how utterly pointless it is if you can't do anything with that knowledge. I mean, even now he's expositing all this to Metron. He needs an audience to listen to his mad ramblings and can't be content with just knowing it. On both Earths, things continue to go haywire. Time itself is still fluctuating as we see heroes from different eras interacting with one another. I'm less familiar with the Marvel side, but on the DC side, we see members of two different Teen Titans teams. The new Teen Titans and the 90s Dan Jurgens one interacting and saving people. Over at the JLA Lunar Headquarters, they start making their plans. As we saw with the villains in the previous issue, Krona has the ability to mentally enthrall people to his will, so he's likely to have an entire army of villains waiting to defend him. Although why he can't just mentally enthrall the heroes is not explained. They think they have a way inside, but they'll need to build a ship to do that. What's more, once in there, they'll need a leader, someone who can turn both teams into one. Superman says that Captain America should be that leader. I'm flattered, but I'm not so sure. The conflicting nature of our two worlds has put us on edge. Frayed tempers, judgments. I know, but you're still the man for the job. I mean, really, you're my second choice. Does anyone know where Rom Space Knight is? Ugh, God, we could really use him. And so they begin reconfiguring one of Aquaman's Atlantean ships into something space-worthy for their needs, and we have the various characters interacting, even Batman and Iron Man taking off their masks to interact as Bruce and Tony. Honestly, there's only one thing missing from this interaction that I think everybody wants to see. Money, Money fight! fight. <laughs> we get some more emotional moments, character bits as they reflect on everything that went down, and what will go down in their own futures. Caps and Soups apologize to each other about their remarks, admitting that they worry sometimes that what they said about each other was true, about doing too much or not enough. Still, it's time to put aside those fears and truly act as one. Cap's gonna be in the command ship coordinating the attack, so he asks Superman to carry his shield into battle for him. Just don't break it, okay? I think the readers would get really upset if I had to will it back together again. With the combined technology and magic that both teams offer, they're able to travel into Krona's stronghold. Which he built out of the remains of Galactus, because Krona's kind of a dick, in case you hadn't noticed. The first wave of defenses comes from the two universes' various terrorist organizations. AIM, HYDRA, COBRA, not the G.I. Joe one, DC has their own version. All that jazz. However, of course, while the ship proceeds in its path, a group of heavy hitters are sent out to deal with the troops. And now, let the cry ring out! Let it shake the ground and rock the firmament above! That Krona shall know! We come for him! Come, Superman! Let's do get help! And so GL, Batman, Wondy, Superman, and Scarlet Witch yell out, Avengers assemble! And Justice League, uh, lambast! Thanks, Wasp! You really added a lot with that. So, more fighting and stuff, with Cap sending out orders to everyone and how to coordinate the battle. And where can I get one of these shields? It's fantastic! Man, I never realized how much I like hitting people with stuff! This is awesome! The temporal instability that was causing time to shift on Earth now hits them in the middle of the battle. Costumes and team members start shifting out, and at a bad time, too, since Krona has decided to up the ante by adding proper supervillains to the mix to start fighting our heroes. He's also finally located Eternity and Kismet, asking Metron to aid him in his interrogation, but Metron refuses. Krona reveals that it was Metron who originally led him to the Marvel Universe, saying that he should be happy to help him since they're both truth seekers. Metron, however, suggests that Krona isn't actually interested in getting answers, but rather conquest. What happens next I leave up to you, but I shall be watching. And believe me, I will be very interested in the outcome. I've got a $20 bet with Uatu the Watcher that you're gonna screw this up royal. 
As you may have noticed, I don't tend to recap fight scenes because, well, there's only so many ways I can say they hit them or they hit back. And sadly, with a book like this, there's just so much going on, so much crammed into each panel that makes it look awesome. So forgive me if I'm skipping over a lot of this. As it goes on, it keeps showing alternate versions of characters as time shifts, more heroes and villains appearing and disappearing, fan servicey moments across the board, like Green Arrow taking up Hawkeye's quiver after it looks like he and the Flash are killed, Batman versus Batroc the Leper, and my personal favorite is Captain America versus Prometheus. You might recall Prometheus, the guy who has a special helmet that lets him upload skills into his brain to make him a better fighter. He's the villain from Cry for Justice, and Captain America beats his ass down while reminding us that he punched Hitler. So screw you, douchebag. Krona realizes that indeed it's conquest that he wants. He's just eternally pissed off that people keep preventing him from learning the answers he's seeking, so he wants everybody to pay for it. Krona, you blew up entire universes because you thought the origins of the universe were like reading someone's diary. Perhaps it's time to admit that you're the asshole. As Krona declares that he's going to destroy Eternity and Kismet as revenge for all this, Scarlet Witch starts pulling more heroes to the battle via chaos magic. And it just goes on and on and on until finally Superman reaches the last wall of Krona's defenses. He can't break through the force field until Thor tosses Mjolnir his way. Naturally, Supes is worthy. And of course, he smashes his way through... But Krona himself now emerges and blasts everyone away, ready now to attack and kill the embodiments of both universes. He's equipped with some kind of giant red orb thingy that's apparently necessary for him to maintain his power, so how convenient then that the Flash and Hawkeye are actually alive, having laid low as per Cap's instructions, and toss a TNT arrow right into the big red globe and blowing it up. A maelstrom of energy is released and Krona gets sucked into it, reality beginning to reorder itself amidst all that. The JLA and Avengers, who were present at the start of this, return to normal, hastened along by the arrival of the Spectre, who physically separates the two Earths once more. They need to get out of there quickly, though, as now that everything is righting itself, Galactus's corpse is reforming into the World Eater. The Flash works to return the Justice League to his Earth, while Thor transports the Avengers to theirs, with Superman and Cap saluting each other for a job well done. You know, these two should really unite again someday. Hmm... Super America. And so our comic ends with the energy Krona had stolen from the destroyed universes coalescing into some kind of weird cosmic egg. Krona's essence is at the heart of it, and one day it'll birth a new universe, a new reality. And yay, it will be called Valiant. Krona will learn the truths he seeks by being a part of them, and we learn that the real wager being played was between Metron and the Grandmaster, and both sides won. Metron diverted Krona to the Marvel Universe, so this would all play out as it did. The Grandmaster doesn't get killed by Krona, Metron doesn't need to add a bit to all the Wikipedia pages that he edits that says, oh, and then Krona destroyed it, and as Metron suggests, perhaps we should do this again someday. Yes, perhaps. Yeah, still waiting on that 15 years later! Any time now would be nice. This comic is nothing short of epic, surpassing all the other crossovers between the two companies. It's got everything. Fantastic art, a story with a massive scale, character bits peppered throughout, and of course, every single fan service -y moment, and all done by creators who are masters of both companies inside and out. Needless to say, it's better that it didn't happen until the early 2000s, since the proposed crossover from the 80s would not have been as great as this one. A long while ago, a lot of people wanted me to review the Marvel vs. DC crossover from the 90s, but as decent as that one is, it feels more like a rough draft after this one, even hitting on a few similar notes here and there. But here's the most fun thing about this crossover. It's in canon. At least on the DC side, anyway. That cosmic egg featured at the end of the story would end up reappearing in another JLA storyline, Syndicate Rules, that brought back the crime syndicate again. While they don't mention the Avengers by name, they do mention Krona destroying their universe and it being reborn again in the wake of those events. The cosmic egg even making a reappearance later in the weekly series Trinity, but that's another story. In the end, JLA slash Avengers is just a fantastic story from start to finish, and I highly recommend it. Next time, we have a Patreon-sponsored episode that fits in with our theme this year of following up on old reviews, as it's finally time for Act 2 of Homestuck. You can stop asking me about it now.
So George Perez apparently developed tendonitis when drawing this cover for issue three. I got nothing else. It's just I totally believe that. <laughs>